The asteroid belt was formed early in the solar system's evolution between Mars and Jupiter, where some scientists believe the small planet originally orbited that was gravitationally destructed by the pull of Mars and Jupiter. Over time, many asteroids were consumed by Jupiter or gravitationally ejected from the solar system, leaving the total mass of the asteroid belt at less than 5% that of the Moon. The formation of the solar system as is pertinent to its geologic bodies may also be tested in this event, primarily focusing on the distribution of different substances around the Sun during the condensation of the protoplanetary disk, the large cloud of dust that condensed around the Sun early in its formation. This describes the most popular of solar system formation theories and is known as the nebular hypothesis. A transneptunian object, or TNO, is a minor planet in the solar system that orbits the Sun with a larger semi-major axis than Neptune, or 30 astronomical units. Extreme transneptunian objects, or ETNOs, are those that have a semi-major axis greater than 150 astronomical units and a perihelion of greater than of greater than 30 astronomical units. The most massive known transneptunian object is Eris, followed by Pluto and 2007 OR10, Makemake, and Haumea. The Kuiper Belt, Scattered Disk, and Oort Cloud are all transneptunian objects. Objects are classified as either Kuiper Belt or Scattered Disk objects based on their orbital characteristics. The Kuiper Belt consists of objects that are either locked in orbital resonance with Neptune or otherwise have approximately circular orbits outside that of Neptune. Scattered disk objects are not locked in orbital resonance with Neptune and have more eccentric orbits. 2007 OR10 is a binary transneptunian object orbiting the Sun in the scattered disk, approximately 1,500 kilometers or 930 miles in diameter. It is the fourth largest object known orbiting the Sun beyond the orbit of Neptune, and is the largest known body in the solar system that has not been named. It is thought to be slightly larger than Makemake, and is hence almost certainly a dwarf planet. It has one known moon, which is approximately 300 kilometers in diameter. 2007 OR10 is locked in a 310 resonance with Neptune. Spectral signatures for both water, ice, and methane have been detected. 2007 OR10's large size means that it may be able to hold on to atmospheric nitrogen, which nearly all transneptunian objects lose early in their evolution. The presence of water ice on the surface of 2007 OR10 suggests a brief period of cryovolcanism in its distant past. Centaurs are objects in the solar system that orbit within the orbit of Neptune and cross the orbit of one or more of the gas giant planets. For this event, we will use the NASA JPL definition of centaurs, which are minor planets with perihelion greater than 2.5 astronomical units and aphelion less than 30.1 astronomical units. Centaurs range widely in eccentricity, and some even have retrograde orbits. In astronomy, a Trojan is a minor planet or moon that shares the orbit of a planet or larger moon, wherein the Trojan remains in the same stable position relative to the larger object. In particular, a Trojan remains near one of the two Trojan points of stability, designated L4 and L5, which lie approximately 60 degrees ahead of and behind the larger body, respectively. Located at L4 and L5 are two of the five stable orbit, um, orbital points, or Lagrangian points. Sometimes these two are called Trojan points. Around Jupiter, these objects are grouped into the Greek camp, located at L4 in front of Jupiter, and the Trojan camp, located at L5, trailing Jupiter. The discovery of the first Earth Trojan, 2010 TK7, was announced by NASA in 2011, orbiting at L4, 60 degrees ahead of Earth. This diagram may be helpful in better understanding the relationships between different types of bodies in the solar system and their classifications. In 2017, Oumuamua became the first known interstellar object to pass through the solar system and is often known as the interstellar interloper. Oumuamua cannot be captured into a solar orbit, so it will eventually leave the solar system and resume traveling in interstellar space. Oumuamua is traveling too fast and at a trajectory that would not allow it to be orbiting the sun. Oumuamua may have ice inside protected by organic compounds forming its outer layer. It is colored red like Kuiper Belt objects, possibly because of exposure to cosmic rays, and may have a surface of organic compounds. 
The second part of the 2019 Solar System event tests students' knowledge of the history and observation of physical and geological processes through both qualitative and quantitative understanding. This part of the exam may include calculations, questions involving real data, as well as diagrams and maps. Questions that fall under this section of the rules may be paired with related questions from Part 1. Students may be asked questions about remote sensing and imagery as related to measuring and observing the objects in Part 1, especially their geologic features. Exams may test students' understanding of why specific wavelengths or specific types of measurements are used for different objects, as well as the roles that object mass, surface, atmosphere, or location play in determining our ability and strategy in studying these objects. Tests may include questions about different kinds of telescopes and instrumentation, including Earth-based or Earth-orbiting observatories, as well as missions to the objects themselves. Example types of remote sensing that could be asked about are radar altimetry, spectroscopy, imaging in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and gravity sensing. In 2019, solar system tests will be limited to questions regarding five key missions that have contributed to past, present, and future understanding of the rocky bodies of Earth's solar system. The five missions students should be familiar with are Voyager 2, Cassini, New Horizons, Dawn, and Lucy. Students should be familiar with how and when important discoveries about these um, about the objects these missions study were made, and understanding the origins of the mission measurements and imagery generated by these missions. Students are expected to have both a quantitative and qualitative understanding of Kepler's laws of planetary motion and should be able to recognize these laws in words, equations, or pictorial form as well as perform basic calculations using these laws. Kepler's first law, the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the Sun at one of the two foci. Students are not required to be familiar with the complete geometry of an ellipse, but should understand the basic principles of its construction and the relationship between perihelion, the distance of closest approach to an object, aphelion, the distance of furthest approach, semi-major axis, the average of the perihelion and aphelion distances, and eccentricity, the variance of the orbit from a circle. Kepler's second law, or the law of equal areas. A line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Kepler's third law. The square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. This may be expressed as p squared equals a cubed. Students should be comfortable using this relation with units of astronomical units for distance and years for period of objects orbiting the sun, but need not be familiar with the role that mass plays for using Kepler's law in systems outside our own solar system. Exams may include questions about tides, specifically regarding the Earth-Moon system. Tides are caused by changes in the relative positions of the Moon and the Earth and the gravitational bulges created by the Moon's gravitational tug on Earth. Students should understand why different parts of the world experience different tidal patterns at different times of day. Students should be familiar with neap tides and spring tides, which occur when the gravitational forces due to the sun and the moon are perpendicular and parallel, respectively. Students should understand and be able to identify eclipses, both from diagrams of the sun, moon, and earth, and as observed from earth. Solar eclipses occur when the moon passes in front of the sun as viewed from earth, blocking all but the outermost regions. Total solar eclipses occur when the entire face, or photosphere, of the sun is blocked, whereas annular solar eclipses occur when the moon is further from Earth and its projection does not fully eclipse the sun. Lunar eclipses occur when the Earth completely blocks the sun from illuminating the moon, allowing only the outermost light from the sun to shine red on the face of the moon when it is refracted around Earth. Students should be familiar with lunar libration or the slight variations in the hemisphere of the moon that is visible to Earth. Questions may cover longitudinal libration, lat latitudinal libration, as well as diurnal libration, and what causes each of them. Longitudinal libration is caused by the lagging of the moon's position relative to Earth due to the moon's eccentric orbit. Latitudinal libration is caused by the slight tilt of the moon's orbital axis relative to Earth's and the variation of the relative tilt angle between the two bodies. Diurnal libration is caused by the motion of observers along the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates, 
meaning observers experience a different view of the moon as they move relative to Earth's center. The phases of the moon and what causes them are also included in part two of the event. The lunar cycle and the relationship between the phase of the moon and what time the moon rises and sets each day may also be tested. For example, this diagram shows a full moon among other phases. Students can infer based on the position of the sun, moon, and earth that a full moon rises in the evening, reaches its highest point in the night sky at midnight, and sets in the morning. Students are expected to be familiar with common processes that shape the geologic surface formation of the solar system's rocky bodies. Cratering is one of the most significant processes in the solar system with regards to shaping the surfaces of rocky bodies. The size and age of different craters can inform scientists about when and where significant cratering events, such as the late heavy bombardment, occurred in the history of the solar system. Lack of craters can inform scientists as to how fast new surface material is being generated or the age of the objects. Volcanism, cryovolcanism, and weathering, or lack thereof, can shape and recycle the surfaces of geologic bodies in the solar system and inform scientists about the evolution of these objects. Weathering from atmospheric dynamics or fluid flows on the surfaces of the objects specified in Part 1 may also be included. The atmospheres of the objects included in Part 1 of the event are important in, both in contributing to the surface characteristics of the objects and in determining how scientists can study them. Different atmospheric conditions, temperatures, compositions, and dynamics determine which wavelengths of light and which methods of remote sensing can be used to study the surfaces of different objects. The example exam, along with an annotated version, will be posted on the Solar System Division B page on the National Science Olympiad event website. The annotated version of the exam can be used by coaches and event supervisors to understand the kinds of questions and test formats that are most appropriate for this exam, as well as the appropriate length and difficulty for a typical solar system exam. Students can take the unannotated version of the exam in preparation for competition this season. This event is sponsored by NASA's Universe of Learning, Astrophysics STEM Learning, and Literacy Network. The National Event Supervisors for Solar System are myself and Dr. Dustin Schroeder, an Assistant Professor of Geophysics at Stanford University in California. Follow the suggestions provided here to prepare for competition. If you have any questions, please submit them online on the Rules Clarification website if they involve the event description. Event supervisors are not allowed to answer any individual questions about the event, as this would be unfair to others. Best of luck, and have a great season!